Okay, looks like I should connect. It says I have an excellent connection. There we go. I had a problem because I couldn't find my shawl. And although I love being outside, the sun on this side of the house is going down. And so, and I didn't want to move all the equipment, so I had to go searching for something. And then I did find my, I couldn't find my shawl. And so I was like determined to find it. Threw it on the bed in the spare bedroom. <clears throat> so now I have my jacket. And my shawl. This is Dr. Annette Farovich, and we are here in the reading room. And we are, we probably only have two more days on this Jane Goodall story. So short and sweet. I kind of like it that way. I don't know. I kind of, I don't know. You, if you want to read longer books, you should. Um, you know, big chapter books, right? You should be, especially if you like, you know, stories like, you know, Harry Potter or Hobbit or, you know, or Lord of the Rings or any of those, you should, you know, try and be reading those first, right? To see if you can't read them. Um, you know, especially if they're really pretty interesting to you. I'm going to look over here what I got going on. All right. Everything's streaming. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, but so I, but I like the shorter books a little bit because I personally get a little bored. <laughs> with the stories. So um, I'm like, okay, I get it. Eh, whatever. Actually, I'm not going to move that too much because I have a good signal. Chapter two, an invitation. This is again, who is Jane Goodall, right? So she lived in Africa, in the woods, in the, um, in the jungle, not the woods, in the jungle with chimpanzees. In 1956, a letter came that changed Jane Goodall's life. It was from an old school friend named Clo. Clo's family had bought a farm in Kenya, Africa. Clo wanted Jane to visit. Did Jane think twice about going? I doubt it. Of course not. Traveling to Africa was expensive. Living in London was expensive too. So June moved back home with her mother in Bournemouth. She saved up money for the trip tr for the trip by working as a waitress. Jane was a very good waitress. She could carry as many as 13 plates balanced on her arms. Oh my gosh, that is pretty good. I was a good waitress. I couldn't do that. No way. No way. Because gosh, if you, if you dropped one, you'd probably drop two or three. Oh my gosh, could you imagine? On March 13th, 1957, Jane's African adventure began. She was turning 23. That's so young, huh? To go to Africa and, and live with the chimpanzees. Did she know she would be living there with among them at this time, I wonder, or thinking that she would? In England, she boarded a ship that arrived in Kenya three weeks later. From the city of Mombasa, she took a train inland. It was April 3rd, her birthday. What a great birthday present. After a long drive on dirt roads, Jane reached the farm in time for dinner and birthday cake. So there you can see where Kenya is located in Africa. So on the continent of Africa, there is Kenya. Tanzania is below it. There's the Indian Ocean on one side and the Atlantic Ocean on the other side. The very first day Jane saw a giraffe. It wasn't in a cage. It was running by the side of a road. She could hardly believe it. What a terrific birthday present that was. Giraffes are my favorite animal. I couldn't even imagine. Could you imagine? It'd be just like, you know, a squirrel running by, right? Out in the wild. Or a deer running by. How about that? A little bit better. A deer running by, right? Jane knew that she couldn't stay at the farm for more than a few weeks. She was a guest, after all. She didn't want to overstay her welcome. What she needed was a job that would keep her in Africa. Jane was in luck. At a party, she met someone who arranged a meeting between Jane and the famous scientist, Louis Leakey. He and his wife, Mary, were British citizens, but Kenya was their home. So there. Oh, 
I don't know what kind of famous scientist he is because he doesn't say, but it looks like a skull. He's <laughs> So he's probably an archaeologist, it looks like, because he's digging up bones, it looks like. So it says, Lewis and Mary Leakey. There's a picture of the giraffe running by her, by her vehicle there along the road. In case you didn't know what those pictures were. Louis Leakey. Louis Leakey was born in August 1903 in Kenya. That's when my grandfather was born. He was born in 1903 as well. He was born in Chihuahua, Mexico. His parents had been born in Great Britain. They went to Africa to teach the Christian religion to the Kikuyu tribe. Lewis's very first home was a tiny hut with a dirt floor. The roof was made of thatch and, and leaked. Growing up, he felt much more African than British. His friends were all Africans, and when he was a teenager, the Kikuyu people honored him with membership in their tribe. Oh, cool. At 13, Lewis found some stone tools made by early humans. This discovery sparked a lifelong career studying the origins of human beings. Along with his second wife, Mary Leakey, he hunted for fossils of human ancestors. The Leakeys worked in an area called, oh, the Leakeys worked in an area called Olduvai, Jorge, and Tanzania, and Tanzania. Put an extra syllable in there. At that, at the time, the country was called Tanganyika. Tanganyika. Besides being a famous fossil hunter, Louis Leakey worked hard to protect the wildlife of Africa. He also helped the careers of two young women who wanted to study wild animals in Africa. One was Jane Goodall. The other was Diane Fossey, who became famous for her work with gorillas. Gorillas in the Mist is a movie about Diane Fossey and her work. I didn't know that. I, I, I knew it was like, I was thinking Jane Goodall, but they didn't say Jane Goodall, so I didn't know. Interesting. Louis Leakey died in 1972 while visiting Jane Goodall's mother, Vanny, in England. Oh, so they were pretty close then, I see. At Old Dubai Jorge in the plains of East Africa, the Leakeys led groups on digs to find fossils. Not dinosaur fossils, the Leakeys were looking for fossils of the very earliest humans. That's no wonder they had these, this picture over there with them and the skull, right? Right? No wonder they had that picture there. Most scientists at the time thought that the first humans were from Asia. Lewis believed they were from Africa. And he was right. Hmm. In 1960, he came upon fossils of very early human species. It came to be known as Homo habilis. Homo habilis lived on Earth from about 2.3 to 1.4 million years ago. It looked more like an ape than like a modern human being. It had a small head, was short, and had very long arms. Homo habilis, right there. From the moment Louis Leakey met Jane, he liked her. She had a shy manner, but he could tell she was smart and had a spirit of adventure. He offered her a job. Naturally, Jane took it. Jane worked as Leakey's secretary at a museum in the city of Nairobi, Kenya. But right away, Leakey gave her the chance to dig for fossils at Old Dubai Jorge. Oh, and there she is digging for fossils right there. Did we talk about the other picture? Oh, look at there's there's like his laboratory there. There's Louis Leakey's a picture of like of, of his laboratory. See all the stuff that's behind him over here? Like in his cases. Kind of looks like our um not Count Olaf, but what was his name? Mortimer Monty Monty. Monty Monty. Right? Jane had never done this type of work before. She didn't know anything about digging for fossils, but she was a fast learner. For hours every day, Jane picked away at the clay and rocks with small tools. Sometimes she unearthed the bone of a creature from the, dinos from the distant past, but usually she found nothing. The work was tiring. During the dry season, the old 
Olduvi, Olduvai Jorge was like a desert. Even so, it was a wonderful time for Jane. She wrote that it was wild, untouched Africa. There were there were all the animals of my childhood of my childhood dreams. She saw lions, a rhinoceros, and loads of gazelles. She saw Dick Dicks, which are little antelopes the size of a fox terrier. I had a I have a picture of a fox terrier on my back on on the lake from like two years ago, and those are they're about this big. They're a little bigger than my Lucy, but they're they're a little longer too. So that's interesting. From Lewis Leakey, Jane learned about the chimpanzees living in the forests near Lake Tanganyika. So we see Jane digging here, right, to get the pictures. So we see Jane digging, and we see a rhinoceros here, and we see gazelles here, and we see these little dick dicks. I've never even heard of them, seriously. They were long, so these are the, um, the chimpanzees that Jane is learning about in the forest near Lake Tang. Tanganyika. They were long-haired chimpanzees. Leakey was interested in chimps because he believed that they had much in common with early humans. Wild chimps are found only in Africa, nowhere else in the world. One study had been done on wild chimps. However, it had lasted for less than three months. Leakey thought that much more time was needed to learn anything important about the chimps. Yeah, probably so. About anything, right? To learn really something very important about anything probably takes longer than three months. You want to learn about me? Probably takes longer than three months. Yeah, he believed Jane Goodall was the right person for the job. Jane did too. In July 1960, she moved from Gombe Stream Game Reserve in what is now the country of Tanzania. First, she met two African scouts who protected the area. Then Jane set off to take a quick look around. Nice having scouts, isn't it? Wow, who paid for them? Her life's work was about to begin. Chapter 3, Life in the Wild. What was it like to live in Gombe Stream in 1960? Steel Gray Mountains rose up from the eastern shore of Lake Tanganyika. Lake Tanganyika. In the valleys between the slopes were forests. It was completely wild. There were no tourists, no safari groups with cameras, and no fancy lodges to stay in. Jane lived near the lake in a little clearing by a small stream. So here we see Tanzania, Burundi there, Tanzania, Burundi, Rwanda. This is, this is Democratic Republic of Congo. Zambia is there. Zambia is where I get, used to get my coffee. I don't get it. They don't really have it there anymore. And there's Gombe Stream Game Reserve right there. So Tanzania, Gombe Game Reserve. What was that? Burundi, Rwanda. Okay. She was cut off from the rest of the world. Even the town of Kigoma was an hour boat ride away. Who besides Jane lived at the campsite? In addition to a cook named Dominic, there was one very imper important person, Jane's mother, Vanny. Oh my gosh, she, she came with Jane. Vanny stayed with Jane for the first four months at Gombe. Oh my gosh, what an awesome thing for her mom to do with her. Oh, and I bet her mom loved it. Mother and daughter lived in the same old army tent together. It had two cots and a separate area for washing up. Mosquito netting covered the front of the tent. Their toilet was outside. It was a deep hole surrounded by a fence. Vanny was a middle-aged woman. Living like this was hard for Jane. It had to be twice as hard for Vanny. Yet officials in Africa had refused to let Jane go off alone to Gombe. They were worried about the safety of a young woman living alone. There was no way Vanny was going to let Jane pass up this chance to live with chimps. Already past 50, Vanny packed up for Africa. It is easy to see where Jane's bravery came from. 
Having Vanny share those first months meant so much to Jane. It was better than having a best friend along. In the evening when she returned to camp, Vanny was there. They'd have dinner and chat. Vanny kept Jane company while she wrote up her notes from that day. I bet it was almost better than having a best friend there. Because you know why? Because moms are nurturing and loving. And that had to be nice. And growing up with a nurturing, loving mom like that had to be really comforting as well. It had to make her feel like she was not just um, had a friend, but had somebody she could really depend on, right? And really talk to. At first, she wrote by hand on line paper. Later, she got a portable typewriter. What did Vanny do all day while Jane was out exploring? Vanny set up a little clinic. She provided basic health care to the local family. She handed out aspirin and cleaned cuts. Sometimes she helped deliver babies. Oh my gosh. Okay, sign me up. I'm going to Africa. Well, wow. mm. I better shut up. I better shut up. I was just talking about how this home is mine. Mm, yeah. About once every two weeks, Jane and Vanny went by boat to Kigoma. In town, they picked up mail and, and enough food and supplies to last until the next trip. They'd stock up on eggs, baked beans, and sausages. At the fruit and vegetable market, they bought bananas, green and yellow oranges, and passion fruit. Two African scouts lived in huts not far from Jane's camp. One always made the trip into Kingo in into King Goma with Jane and Vanny. It was not considered proper for two white women to travel alone. The main job of the scouts was to help Jane find her way through the forest. These forests were home to chimpanzees. Jane, however, did not like having a scout along. Why? Two people made more noise than one person alone in the forest and noises scared away the chimps. Also, the scouts didn't like to start off as early as Jane. She was always up before dawn, and often the scouts wanted to head back to camp way before Jane did. So after a while, the scouts let Jane explore by herself. Wow, that is brave, isn't it? In the jungles of Africa? I don't know. Now she was free to go at her own pace. Sometimes she sat on the ground. Sometimes she perched in trees. She could, she could stay overnight if she wanted. Plus, being alone made it easier to remain unseen by the chimps. Because of how far away the chimps were, Jane carried binoculars with her. She took a tin box with her, too. It contained a sweater, a blanket, some food, coffee, and a mug. I left my coffee inside. Jane always wore her hair in a ponytail, and she wore the same outfit every day, a tan shirt and tan shorts. Colorful clothes would make her stand out too much. Uh-oh, got to count me out. She wanted to blend in with the background. Often she had to crawl through tangled vines. She got bitten by flies and scratched by sharp grass. Oh, that doesn't sound so horrible. I get bitten by flies and scratched by thorn bushes. Those thorns over there and these trees and those stupid bushes over there, they are literally this long. They're literally, that's got to be three and a half inches long. Thanks, neighbor. See my mystery series. But nothing stopped her. Grass or flies didn't stop her. Wow. <laughs> Was Jane Goodall afraid of anything? Well, apparently not grass or flies. Yes, she was scared of leopards. Well, there you go. Now you're talking Africa. She knew the smell of leopards, and many times Jane caught their scent in the forest. She sounds like an animal. Like, right? I bet you would, though. I bet you would. Wow, I wonder what they smelled like. Had to be kind of a little bit like an animal. What else? I mean, not like a dog, right? Not like a wet dog. I don't smell my dog. How do you smell a leopard? They had to stink. <laughs> Why does it say I've dropped 8,000 frames? Ugh. Ugh. And yet I have excellent stream. She knew the leopard smell. She knew the smell of leopards, and many times Jane caught their scent in the forest. One time she had to climb a tree to get away from a leopard. She was lucky the leopard did not climb up after her. Instead, the leopard pooped on the rocks where Jane had been sitting only a few minutes before. There she is crawling through, getting cuts and scratches, right? There's the leopard right there, pooping.
here she is. I didn't show that picture. Here Jane is climbing through the, you know, the forest without the scout for the first time. Going at her own pace. Here she is in the forest with the scout. Or going, leaving with the scout. I didn't show you those pictures. Let me see if there's another one that I didn't show you before that. Yes, I didn't show you a thousand of them. Oh, Vanny and Jane. And it looks like some, I don't know. Going to the stores and getting supplies, I think. Oh, and here they are talking and having coffee together, her and her mom. Okay, those are all the pictures I didn't show you. Jane couldn't always see Chim, so, so how sh did she know where to look? She knew the sounds that chimps make. Hearing certain cries tipped her off that chimps were in the area. Jane would pick out a spot and sit. She'd, sit. she'd stay for hours, quietly waiting and watching. Some days, she didn't see any chimps. chimps. Even so, she was sure they were watching her. Other days, she saw many. Sometimes a few large males would gather together. Sometimes she spotted a mother with her young. Sometimes she caught sight of a bigger group of males, females, and young chimps. The trouble was that the chimps were always so far off, and they never were doing anything very interesting. Jane hoped to spy on chimps playing together or watch a mother caring for her baby chimp. Instead, all she saw were chimps searching for food. They'd climb up fig trees and pull off fruit. However, the minute Jane tried to move closer to them, the chimps would run away. How was she going to learn anything that mattered? And there's the last picture there of her, you know, without any fear, her binoculars climbing into the branches there. And there are the chimps playing in the trees. Okay, we will come back uh, tomorrow, Thursday, uh, for Chapter 4 on the chimps. Thanks for joining me. We have a full day tomorrow with our philosophical classroom, so we won't meet here until 3.15 on Thursday. Thanks for being here in the classroom. I really enjoy this this. Uh, looking at how I look over here. I really enjoy doing this. I'm a teacher and uh, I am Dr. Annette Farovich and a teacher doesn't do anything but two things. She learns and she teaches. I will see you tomorrow in the classroom.